Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 466. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. This week's interview is with Dr. Tracy Brower. Tracy is a sociologist dedicated to studying work-life fulfillment and happiness. She's an award-winning speaker and the author of two books, The Secrets to Happiness at Work and Bring Work to Life by Bringing Life to Work. Tracy's also a contributor for Forbes.com and Fast Company, and her work has been featured in TEDx, The Wall Street Journal, and Fortune.com, amongst others. In addition to her day job as Vice President at Workplace Insights with the Applied Research and Consulting Group at Steelcase, She's a board member of the United Way of Greater Ottawa County and a council member with the Design Museum Everywhere. In this conversation with Tracy, we discuss what is and can be happiness at work, how much of yourself you should bring to work, the importance of self-knowledge as a leader, and what one can do as a leader to bring happiness to the workplace. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com and do please consider to drop in your rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Tracy Bauer, great to have you piped in from Michigan, if I'm correctly, the wonders of digital. In your own words, Tracy, how would you like to describe yourself? Oh, thank you for having me. First of all, I super appreciate it. Yeah, so my name Tracy Brower, and my new book is called The Secrets to Happiness at Work. I am a PhD sociologist, and I study work life and happiness. My previous book was actually called Bring Work to Life. I'm also a vice president of Workplace Insights for Steelcase, and I'm a contributor with Forbes.com and Fast Company. So super delighted to talk with you today. Well, that's a, a basket full of things. Um, let's just uh, talk about Steelcase for a second. Steelcase, who are they? What are they? What do you do for them? I uh, I'm the vice president of Workplace Insights. Steelcase is the global leader in providing work environments, work experiences to help people reach their best potential wherever they're working. So we do office furniture and lots of other products that support the work experience. Right. So materially making people comfortable, ergonomy at the workplace. Yes. And focusing on the work experience holistically, the culture, the process, the tools, the space, and how those come together to create a great experience for people. And this is where I get really excited too, is, you know, we spend a lot of our time at work and work can be part of such a fulfilling life when it's at its best. And so, uh, so that's what we really pay attention to is how to make that a great experience in a holistic sense. Yeah. If you're going to spend 70 hours or whatever a week, might as well be comfortable, might as well have a good internet connection and such like to make it work. So let me just go back to your first book, because for sure I haven't read it, but it it does very much intrigue me, um, this notion of bring work to life by bringing life to work. Question, let's start this with, is how much of you do you need to bring to work to bring work to life? Mm, I love that question. That's really good. You know, I think we need to bring as much of ourselves as we can and as much as we're comfortable with. Um, Maybe the right answer is uh, as much um, as much as we can and not too much. So um, we, of course, we want some separation. We want privacy. We want kind of life outside of work. We don't want work to be so central that we lose all else. However, I think that in the popular press, work has become such a negative, right? Like we sort of exaggerate that work is about the salt mines and it's about the grind and the best part of work is PTO and weekends. But in reality, work is a place where we express our talents, we express our skills. All work has dignity and it's how we contribute to our communities. And so when we can bring our whole selves, our talent, 
our personality, our foibles, our mistakes, our um, imperfections, and have that embraced by the work that we're seeking to accomplish and by the people that we work with, that's what we really want to see. I, I completely agree with this notion. I've, I mean, I've long talked about how business is personal. And in my last book, my the subtitle is How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. Mm-hmm. Yet, when you at, uh, attach importance to your work and it becomes part of your identity, the more you're yourself at work, the harder it might be to extract yourself from that identity and from that workplace. Yeah, I think that's a really good good point. And I, I love the idea of authenticity. Like we want to bring our whole selves and 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 work is a fundamental place that we get that sense of social identity. And that actually started, you you did the same research, I'm sure. That actually started during the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution had a lot of negatives. Let us not let us not pass over those. But one of the things that happened is that people used to get their identity on the farm doing, you know, churning butter with family and harvesting fields with friends and cousins and, you know, sisters and brothers. And then people moved to cities en masse. And now our identity and our relationships were tied up if we were a baker with other bakers, if we were horseshoeing horses with other people horseshoeing horses. And so that's where the idea of our social identity coming from our work really started. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like like we can form close relationships with people we work with frequently because we're striving toward a common purpose together or we have similar interests because we work in a similar field or a similar department. And so I think that that can be a really healthy thing. And of course, we need a healthy boundary as well. We all need time, you know, away from work. And in fact, there's some brilliant research on happiness. And the thing that we already know is when we're happy in our work, we perceive greater happiness outside of work. But the opposite is also true based on statistical evidence. When we're happier outside of work, we perceive greater happiness inside of work as well. So when we work on that Habitat for Humanity build or we volunteer in the soup kitchen or we tutor, uh, you know, children or something like that, those bring us happiness and greater perception of happiness inside of work. So we have this full life and we want to express our full amplitude at work, outside of work, and through both our vocation, what we get paid to do, and our avocation, what we may do in our passion areas. So since you talked about the Industrial Revolution, I can't help but think of Marx, who talks about alienation at work and the inability to feel, to identify into the work. So we build a product that gets shipped off, sent to a customer who probably is much richer than I am. And, and, and he breaks down all the different forms of alienation, which were discussed presciently, I would say, those many years ago. Now, it seems, and I don't know what you've seen, Tracy, but study after study talks about some kind of number of 70% of people being disengaged at work. So it would seem that from the Industrial Revolution to now, we haven't learned. Or, I mean, of course, I exaggerate because things have changed and we've got policies and we have HR and we have holidays and such like. But there's, there's still an inability for people to lean into that farm feeling where I'm on my farm with my animals and my food. It, it feels like we're just employees still clocking in, clocking out. And this idea of happiness is, is rather elusive. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And we're going through this great resignation, great reflection. I like to call it the talent revolution. And I think it is some of the best evidence that things aren't working perfectly today. You know, the popular press will also say, oh, working from home is working perfectly and everybody's happier than they've ever been. And that may be partially true for some people or partially true for many people um, in parts of their lives. But in general, I think we're really starting to have this new level of consciousness about work because through its absence, we are thinking more consciously about 
why we work, what we do, for whom we work, with whom we work, where we work, how we work. At, at a very macro level, we're thinking about that. And I think that's a really good thing. When we can reflect on those kinds of things, we can think about how do we improve it? How do we move from Marxism where we're alienated or Taylorism where we're, you know, thinking about production beast. widget and how many widgets and whether you're rewarded for your widgets. And I think a, a big picture, there are two ways to think of that holistically. One is I think there's an issue of line of sight and purpose. Like when we can see that line of sight from my work to his work and her work and their work and the customer, that helps us feel like we matter more. We have that, that continuation of my work to the end, period. When we have a sense of purpose, I think that's really helpful. And purpose that relates to people is important. But I also think that we can dream small. And that is a very good thing. Like our purpose doesn't need to be solving world peace or solving world hunger or inventing the next amazing thing. Whatever we do well is a way that we're contributing to our community. And so it's really fair that we wake up in the morning and do our best work, whatever that work is. And the thing that's interesting about happiness here is that there's no perfect choice, right? Like whatever role you choose, there'll be things you love about it and things that aren't your favorite. And so the best choices we can make are the ones where there's the most alignment, as much alignment as possible between what we really love to do and what we have to do every day. That alignment will never be perfect, but as much as possible when we do that. So I think that the Marxism, Taylorism, the separation between us and the value that we create is where we've gone wrong. And how we get that back is to remind ourselves of our value, for organizations to recognize and appreciate people for their value, and to remind people the contribution they're making to the greater whole, to the greater community. I love it. So you use this expression, line of sight, Tracy, and I just want to make sure I understand it. It's, it's feeling connected into your contribution of what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think of purpose as three things. Purpose is feeling like there's something greater than yourself outside of yourself, number one. Number two, feeling like you can make a unique contribution to it. And number three, it's always got to be about people, right? I'll sign up as a good corporate citizen for 15% annualized growth, and I'll do the right thing for the customer all day long. But the thing that will really get me out of bed in the morning is thinking about the impact I have on people. So for me, that idea of line of sight is about being reminded and having a, an organizational culture that clarifies my role and how it relates to that purpose out there, how I'm making that unique contribution, how my um, talents, skills, capabilities are contributing to the people that we serve as an organization. I liked before when you talked about not necessarily looking for the Indira Gandhi or you know the, 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 the mega purpose and thinking about smaller purpose. It is my observation, Tracy, that people are attaching importance to purposes which are often too far removed from who they are. And the because that I, you know, I'm not a sociologist by any means, but the because for me is that for the most part, they haven't actually figured out who they are in the first place. So they see this, let's call it a shiny object in the news a lot today. Oh, that's terrible. I, I really want to support that. So I jump on that shiny object and then the next one or another, rather than doing some more important work that can be more meaningful locally. Yeah, I agree. I think that self-awareness, that reflection are so important. There was a lovely study that was done not too long ago that talked about how many people globally have been reprioritizing because of the pandemic they've been thinking harder about what means the most to them and what is rising in priority are the community, friends, um, having more experiences. And we know that 
statistically, the more we do experiences versus purchasing material goods, right, that's more correlated with happiness. But I think that has to do with who we are, too, and not kind of chasing that bright, shiny object, having that center of what's most important to us, and then expressing that in multiple ways. One of the things that I really like is the happiness paradox, which talks about how if we pursue happiness for its own sake, we will be significantly less likely to accomplish it because we're focused on ourselves, which is negatively correlated with happiness. We're much more likely to be happy when we're focused on the community and others. And because it focuses us on what we don't already have, otherwise, why would we be pursuing something? So instead of pursuing happiness for its own sake, kind of that bright, shiny object, happiness is outside of myself, there's a much better way to accomplish happiness, and that is by creating the conditions for happiness and actually reminding ourselves of um, of how much we are empowered to create that for ourselves. We don't have to wait for the conditions. We don't have to pursue some, some thing outside of ourselves. We can absolutely be empowered to create the conditions around us toward it. And I think your point, right? I love that. When that is utterly connected with our identity, when we're centered and reflective about what that is, we can be so much more meaningful in what we're pursuing in the first place. Yeah, right, back to this line of sight. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Tracy, um, what are the questions I want to ask you? Well, let me just start with another one because you said it and it just jolted my mind. Sociologists. I have um, a belief that work is very often, too often, filling people with competencies. uh, And when you jump ship, you just do the same thing somewhere else. And, And too little diversity of cognition and diversity of backgrounds. You know, if you get a bunch of engineers who hold an engineering school, well, you might be missing a beat as far as user experience or other things. So I, I've always thought about philanthropists, or sorry, philanthropists, um, philosophers or sociologists and, and other types of schools of study as having a tremendous use in business. And so do you find yourself um, waving the flag of sociology as a, a useful tool in business? Uh, or, and some people look at you with a raised eyebrow. How does that go down for you? Yeah, absolutely. Because sociology is the study of groups and how groups behave, right? And, and I like to think about how we affect our work and how it affects us back. But at a fundamental level, um, work is this place where we find our humanity. And our fundamental needs are expressed in our work, and our work needs to meet some of those fundamental needs. So like one of the things you talked about is if people are jumping ship a lot, which we know is happening, right? That's really an interesting situation that we find ourselves in. If if our typical white collar professional work takes you, I don't know, 12 or 18 months to really, really get up to speed, But then if we're moving positions every 18 or 24 months, then as a society, we're constantly new employees, right, who are trying to find our bearings. And so how do we get to a point that we're functioning at our best, not just at the best that the organization wants, but at our best? And I love your point about diversity as well. Um, Statistically, personality, statistically, our choice of career is a great proxy for personality. Personality and career choice tend to be fairly aligned. So if we choose to be an engineer, we tend to hang out with people who are similar to us. Or if we choose to be an accountant or we choose to be a sociologist, we tend to run into people like us. And our algorithms work too well, right? We tend to get information on an everyday basis that agrees with what we already know. And we need to branch out. We need to think differently. In fact, another thing that I love is um, the data about learning and stretch. When we learn new things, when we stretch, when we don't already know how to do something, when we are sweating, either literally or figuratively, that is significantly correlated with happiness as well. 
And part of the way that we put ourselves in situations to stretch and to be challenged is through diversity, through exposing ourselves to diverse thoughts, through exposing ourselves to diverse areas of the business, through exposing ourselves to things that are new to us. And so I think that's something we need to pay attention to. Maybe jumping ship frequently can be an avenue for diversity, more variety. Um, but I think we also need to be really intentional about finding people who are, um, who are diverse. And this is part of what sociology can bring to business, right? Mm -hmm. Like helping to remind ourselves of what do we need and what makes us happy in the first place. And therefore, how can we design our work our businesses, our cultures in a way that's best for people. So yeah, the sociologists work in business is a, a really rich and exciting place to be. I can only encourage people to explore hiring people with different backgrounds. And I'm not just talking about uh, visible backgrounds, but different ways of thinking, different schools of, of thought. And especially when we're talking about humanity and and the fact is that, as you said before, it's about people, community, and the people within that community that make things meaningful. And so you have to learn about that. So I was wondering, Tracy, um, and I wanted to make put this, maybe it's framed this in this way. It is my observation that authenticity, or it's my, maybe my supposition, that authenticity has come to the fore in large part because of a lack of self-awareness and a desire for authenticity which they may not have and when when people say uh, oh, they study psychology oftentimes they study psychology less initially to discover the psychology of others but to analyze my own psychology so tracy in that when you start writing a book about happiness what brought you to happiness Oh, that's such a good question. It reminds me of, um, you know, any psychiatrist, any psychologist worth their salt is in therapy themselves. Right? Of course, that's the you point. You can't pull somebody else up the mountain if you don't have a really good, you know, connection into the mountain with your own, with your own, uh, with your own clip. So what brought me to happiness is um, thinking about how it all comes together and kind of connecting the dots. Like I've worked for a few companies. I've worked with hundreds of companies and some of those experiences have been amazing and wonderful. And I reflect on those and I think what worked about that. And in other cases, I've had experiences that have been absolutely terrible. Like we've all had experiences of both kinds. And so I think it's really helpful to understand those, to codify those. And I always think that writing is a way of thinking, right? Like the next article I write is I'm writing it because I'm really interested in thinking about that thing. I hope other people are interested in it too, right? Um, but it's a little bit of both, I think, when you write and when you um, are creating and codifying thoughts. So I think what brought me to happiness was really... Um, being in a place where I was experiencing a lot of happiness, reflecting on a place where it had not been a good experience, and bringing those together to say, so what? So what do we do about this? So where do we go? So what does this mean to us as individuals and as groups and as societies? So your book came out in May 21, um, The Secrets to Happiness at Work, How to Choose and Create Purpose and Fulfillment in Your Work. Uh, I like this part, which was a personal development book to avoid burnout in your career. You presumably wrote this in large part, at least a large part of it was during the pandemic. Um, so in your writing, what did you, what, what sort of quirky thing did you learn maybe about yourself or, or about the study of happiness in writing your book? Mm, oh, wow. That's a really great question. It was so interesting because I got the contract to write the book before the pandemic, before any of us knew what was coming. I started it just at lockdown. And I asked the publisher, like, what should I do about this? Do I infuse it? Do I mention it? Do I not mention it? And then it was published in May of 2021. And that was a time when we thought we were coming out of it. And I thought, oh, what a great moment. The birds are singing and the weather is getting nice in Michigan and other places as well. And, you know, that wasn't to be, right? Like we had more waves. 
Um, and so it was interesting, the bookends of the writing process and then the publishing moment. And I think the thing that I really came to is a couple of things. One is, um, this is a really good time to think about happiness. When we are going through really hard times, when happiness seems especially elusive, it's a really good time to think hard about what, what is meaningful to us and how do we create the conditions for ourselves? That's one. Another thing is kind of this idea that we talked about before, right? Like happiness isn't a silver platter and when the conditions are right on the silver platter, everything shall be happy, right? The other thing that I always struggle with in the writing journey is that you can never get it all. Mm. And you want to, right? Like you want to say, okay, what's everything I know about happiness? And I'm going to put it in these pages. And then a really important part of it is the calling, is the taking away, not the adding, but the taking away. Um, and that is hard and heartbreaking, right? Like the things mm. that hit the room floor are some of the mm. things that you really love still. And so my takeaway from that is that is that you just keep exploring it, you know? And so that's what I love about being able to write articles as well, right? You just mm -hmm. keep exploring it. You find that new piece of research and you explore that and you add something else to the pile of what you're wondering about and you explore that. And so there's, it's sort of a bittersweet experience. You can't cover it all. And yet you can add and glean and explore and wonder mm. on a continuous basis. Yeah, the editing process is is clearly difficult. In my book was I submitted my manuscript one week before lockdown, and then uh, my publisher went on furlough, and so I had a wholly different experience, similar timing as far as you were concerned. Um, so I, I definitely can relate to the, those differences. So many people ask me how I felt when George Floyd was killed. And as I sit across a table from a black man who's about to talk about how the murder of another black man felt, I don't think it really matters how I feel. Hello, I'm Stephen Dorsey, host of Black and White from Evergreen Podcasts. We'll explore and explain how white advantage, bias, and outright discrimination continues to plague our society. Black and White is available wherever you listen to podcasts. So um, happiness, I, I kind of feel that happiness can only exist if you know unhappiness. You were talking about it being the time to explore happiness, but at some level, as soon as you start exploring happiness, uh, what happens to unhappiness? Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely the right question. Um, one of the things that we know is that if we are in a state of nirvana with no unhappiness at all, we can get kind of bored. You know, like people, people talk about that all the time. There's this really interesting global study that's been done for like 20 years. And it asks people, if you won the lottery, would you still work? 93% of people say, absolutely. I, was, I may not do exactly what I do today. And I may spend a little more time relaxing on a tropical beach than what I do today. But one way or the other, I would still work. Um, and so we want a certain amount of challenge. There's a beautiful concept of eustress, um, which is the idea that if you have just the right amount of challenge difficulty, it will keep you coming back. If you have none, nah, you don't need to come back to that thing. You've already mastered it. If you have too much and you think, oh, I'll never get there, you're not going to come back. But the 85% rule says if you fail 85% of the time, that is what will keep you at peak motivation. You will keep coming back to get through that thing. So that is the idea of challenge and stress and difficulty. But there is also the question of unhappiness. And when we struggle, when we fail, we tend to build resilience. Um, there's a lovely concept of post-traumatic growth. We all know about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but post-traumatic growth is also a thing. When we go through really hard times and when we come through those, we learn about our own priorities. We learn about the people we can rely on and we learn about our own capabilities. 
And so that tends to build the sense of resilience over time. Um, and so that's not to Pollyannaize bad times, but it is to say that they give us perspective and they help us to appreciate the good times. That amplitude, that up and down, that ebb and flow is part of real life. And I think one of the things that can happy to happen with happiness is we say, oh, if I'm not happy all the time, I must not be doing it right. He looks like he's happy all the time. He's got it right. You know, we're judgy, we're comparison oriented. Um, but in reality, happiness ebbs and flows. And we can have an overall sense of joy and contentment that we bring and manifest um, and, and demonstrate um, at the same time that we have that ebb and flow. When I wrote uh, one of my third book was on empathy. And um, oftentimes I would, I would talk about it amongst my friends and, and I get little sly comments like, well, Minta, you're not always empathic. And I was just wondering about your experience with writing a book about happiness well, Tracy, you don't look very happy today. And what kind of snide remarks you've had to suffer through when you started approaching such a topic? Yeah, really. I think we, uh, we assume that people outside of ourselves maybe don't struggle in the way that we all do, right? So, uh, so we, tend to, we tend to do that comparison. Yeah, I think it is true that people look at you with a new lens, with a new level of critique based on what you're writing. Is, is she really demonstrating that concept? Is she really demonstrating that other concept? And I am a really big believer in a level of authenticity where we can kind of talk about our mistakes and talk about, you know, with a level of humility, hey, I'm just trying to find my way out of the paper bag, you know, <laughs> just like everybody else. I'm just trying to do my best. And I don't have it all figured out. I just, I think this idea of professional humility, intellectual humility is fundamental to great leaders, to great individuals, because intellectual humility, personal humility allows us to learn new things, allows us to be resilient, allows us to contribute in new ways. If we've got it all figured out, you know, there's there's no uh, humility, there's nothing new to learn, then we're limiting ourselves and we're limiting our communities, right? We can't contribute as much to those. So I'll put myself out there and uh, be authentic and welcome critique. Well, yeah, and welcome that we're not perfect beings. Yet I, I still feel, Tracy, that we operate in an environment, especially at work, where vulnerability, uh, expressing that I don't know something, it can feel like a career-threatening statement. And, and if we are still running around with 70% disengaged employees, I, I'm, somehow I feel like it's top of Maslow's pyramid, people thinking about humility. I still got to get my bloody job. I, you know, I, I hate my job. And, and it, it almost feels like we're far away from at some level, the real problems. And, and I think specifically, the ability to change leader mentality mindset to embrace humility. Uh, and uh, obviously, this might be a little sexist, but typically men's ability to let go of the ego, which is a part of humility. And when we get into purpose, it's transcending the, the notion that we are here to make money and, and to find some bigger element, bigger ends, if you will, than just being successful. Yeah, I think that a lot of times we have this um, assumption or this false contradiction that either people benefit or business benefits. Binary. I, precisely, precisely. And when we, the truth is, when we do the right thing for people, good things happen for business, right? When we do the right thing for people, because it's the right thing to do, period, end of sentence, when we do the right thing for people, they want to do better work. We have this human um, system of reciprocity, this human instinct for reciprocity. Um, and and we want to do our best because we feel that connection to our colleagues. We feel that connection to our organizations. And so businesses benefit from that. And it's also a good thing when business benefits, if I'm an employee, 
it, like that contributes to my job security and my ability for, you know, to collect my paycheck and all of that. So I think that's important. And I also think that, um, that we can consider empathy and consider the way we show up together and the influence we have on each other. Like leaders have a responsibility to create the conditions as much as possible for people to do their best, for themselves to do their best. That is the kind of structural component. But then there's also agency, like sociologically thinking, the number one way that people learn is through watching other people, listening to other people, experiencing other people. And so we all have an influence over others, maybe more than we even realize. Leaders have an outsized impact because of the leadership laser, but also we all have such an influence. And so I think we really can consider how we show up, how we influence others, how we each lead, no matter what our role is, and we can contribute to kind of that more positive environment that we all want to be part of. I'm guessing that yeah. you're... Do you see that differently? No, no, I, I want to get to... But um, I'm guessing that you're a fan of Dan Pink's work. Uh, mm -hmm. If you combine the the uh, idea of mastery of what you're doing, uh, agency and purpose, we're in the heart of Dan Pinkland. Yet, if I'm a an employee and I'm trying to be intentional about my happiness and, and doing what I can... I'm smiling uh, to make me happy uh, and, and wanting to be happy, but I've got a shit boss. What kind of tools, what, what would you suggest to them? A jump ship or what can you do to mm -hmm. enable a boss to see the light? And then the next question is, if I'm the boss, what do I need to do? Uh, what are the, th the practical tips that I need to do to allow for that happiness to exude within my team? Yeah. Of course, read your, read your book would be the simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I always like to think about the relationship of how big the issue is and how much influence I have. And, you know, any good researcher will plot that on a two by two, right? So if I've got um, a really big issue that's systemic in my organization, maybe it's a toxic culture, maybe not just my leader is bad, but lots of the leaders are poor. They're not empathetic. They're trying to, um, you know, kind of take as much as they can from employees. If that is a systemic issue, and if I have lots of influence, I might choose to stay and work on that system through policies and practices, through the influence that I have personally, through the um, tasks that I complete in new ways and the initiatives and the, uh, the hand that I raise to volunteer to do new product projects and the way that that impacts. On the other hand, if it's a giant systemic issue and I have very little influence, I might choose to go someplace else that's a better match for where I feel like I can make my greatest contribution. And you can do the rest of the two by two. Right. How much right but how, how do I do that? If I'm an external and I go to the HR person, it says, oh, we're, we're a great place to work. Look, we, we got this, uh, we got this award. We're a great place to work. Um, we really, we really empower everybody. I mean, blah, blah, blah. So how, how does one make that match when you're, when you're assessing jumping ship, first of all, I wouldn't suggest jumping ship and then finding a job on balance. I'd say stay in your job and look for another job. But in terms of having that reading, what, cause the HR person really isn't the person you're going to be, I mean, unless you're working in HR, who's actually going to be your line manager and, and the dealing with the day-to-day -day shit that happens with your boss or, or, you know, clients and so on. So I, I'm just wondering, how do you, I mean, is there some, insight that you have about how to assess whether I can go into the right job. Uh, if I'm a young person, I, yeah, I like this thing that Tracy's talking about, but how, how do I know it's the right place for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wrote an article about this too. I think you can look for small signals, right? Like what's the responsiveness that you've had in the interview process? Um, what ways are emails worded? What level of warmth is in an email? How many were, uh, how many times is the word we used versus the word I used? Like those tiny signals that kind of cue you into things. That's one. I think another is um, the extent to which you have contact with multiple 
multiple people in that interview process, that's really helpful to understand. Is it just one really cool person or are there other people who seem to be people that I would want to work with? And how much consistency is there in their behavior and in their approach and in their messaging? Not because they've planned it, but, but because they seem to have a similar sort of set of values. That's another. I think we can also, in our assessment process, those are more intuitive in the assessment process. I think we can also be really planful about asking hard questions and not just asking questions that are easy to answer, like tell me about your culture or tell me about the system for growth in the organization, right? We can ask questions about how, what happens when people make mistakes in this organization? What are the reasons that people leave this organization? What are the things that happen that are landmines in this organization? What are the things that cause people to fail in this organization? Asking tough questions like that, first of all, the openness to answering those tough questions gives you a clue, but also the answers to those questions give you a clue. So those are three ways that I think we can make that assessment. Um, and then I think once we're in a role, we can also think about how do we influence the culture, right? One thing that I've talked about is like how we show up. But I think we can also um, give feedback in the system when that's, when that's safe to do. You're not going to go to the CEO and say, hey, I've got some feedback for you on that last thing that you talked about. Probably. Maybe you would, but maybe not. Um, but, there are, but there are other ways that we can influence within meetings and give feedback and kind of be open about those things things. Um, I think we can also be extraordinarily supportive of colleagues and form trusting relationships and then be able to, um, as we're supporting others, as we're helping them be better, we're contributing to the culture as a whole. So there are definitely things that we can, you know, there's lots more we can unpack there, but in general, whatever kind of role we have, we can think about that locus of control, that sphere of influence that's this whatever our area of influence is and, and take that influence and sort of um, articulate our opinions, um, share our feedback, give our points of view, support other people, and those affect the culture significantly. So I loved those uh, tips and tricks, if you will, and the tough questions really rings the bell. So I need to make a link to that article in particular, Tracy. And it also reminds me, and I and again, I might get into sticky wicket here, but Back in the 80s, I used to work in investment banking, and they did a study at Brown University that looked at what uh, were the indicators of success when a, an analyst, a stock analyst, stock, uh, like a, they would be analysts for the industry of tobacco or telecommunications or whatever, and they transferred from one bank to another, and what would make them successful? And... Uh, so they, it was 5,000 people they, they study and they're all they're called the II, the Institutional Investor Awarded high, Highly Noted Successful uh, Analysts. And they only came up with one uh, grouping that seemed to be a predictor of success from one bank to the other. And that was that they were a woman. And, and the reasons were twofold. And one of those two reasons were they typically ask the tough questions. And so I, I was working in a bank when I, I read this and I, and I, it was very much the boys would ask boys club questions. The woman would ask, how can you guarantee my success in this environment? How many toilets for women are there on the floor that I'm working? Uh, you know, so anyway, tougher questions. And, you know, how many women do you have on the executive committee? Well, that's a really good question, Tracy, because um, we're, we're right now, we have 15%. We really want more. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting. Or, yeah, well, we're, we're currently at 45%. You know, we've been struggling to get to 50. Different, right? In mm -hmm. terms of environment. Anyway, we're asking these tough questions is super important. I want to finish off with uh, two, because uh, two practical elements and, and that really struck me in, in what you write about, Tracy. And the first is the idea of investing in experiences as a way to foster, encourage happiness. Give us um, the pitch on, on what we talked about experience at the very beginning, but 
why, why and how can you make that happen in a company? Why and how can you make that happen in a company? So experience is helpful because it engages our memory in more ways. And experience is cool when you're experiencing it, and it tends to be cool later. The other thing about experience is that we generally experience things with others. And so it's more of a community-oriented uh, thing that is also more rewarding to us. I think the way that we can create those experiences within the organization is to give people opportunities out of their swim lane. So um, we might ask people to spend 80% or 90% of their time on their job that they're getting paid to do. And then we need to um, give them the opportunity to maybe contribute in another department or maybe contribute to another project or maybe contribute to another initiative. And those new experiences go back to that learning that we were talking about, right? Like I'm doing something I don't exactly know how to do, but it's also a new experience with new people and a new department and maybe a new language of the organization that I'm not as familiar with. So pragmatically, we can create those opportunities for people to um, participate outside of their swim lane. That might be by talking to another leader and uh, asking that maybe our team member be involved. It might be with a HR program that allows people to um, uh, float into other roles for short periods of time. The other thing to know is that um, if we want to build teams, we significantly tend to rely on social experiences, right? We, we do a Zoom happy hour, or we think about going to an escape room, or we think about going I don't know, to a rock wall together. And so those are all good. Keep doing the social stuff. But the more powerful way to create belonging and create um, a sense of bonding is through task, when we have to roll up our sleeves and work together on something. And so another thing that we can do pragmatically is assign people in different teams, in different departments potentially, to a task that they share with a common goal, with a common end in mind. Um, that tends to build social capital across the organization and build relationships across the organization. It also gives us that opportunity for learning um, and it gives us that opportunity to feel more connected, feel more engaged um, that we've been discussing. So those are some of the things that we can, we can think about. So I want to just um, push into, not necessarily back, uh, this notion of creating tasks. It, I feel like we're in a situation now where it's highly risky to assign somebody to a task that they may not succeed in doing. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not good for business, but I, I feel like the bond is strongest when the unpredictability of success in the task and the richness of the challenge is actually what bonds you together. Because if I know upfront, I'm going to do this and I'm the boss and duh, and oh yeah, well, it's not that hard. Well, you know, you're, you're setting up for success, sure, but a little bit too much. And in our world, it seems like back to a little bit your the humility point and our imperfections. It's almost like, well, if, if and you think about educating your child in the same vein, you know, giving them a project and oh, look, come back and they did a really good job and, and you give them a bravo. But it's we're setting up for confidence, if you will. But what of this notion of deeper, harder challenge where, you know, shit may happen and it may not work? Yeah, this is the growth mindset, right? Like, if we're going to give people tough challenges, we have got to be prepared to stand with them when they fail. If we give them tough challenges, they won't succeed every time. And we need to be about the learning process. And I know organizations always need to be about performance and productivity, and we don't have a lot of time to fail. So, you know, like do as right as you can, please, right? Um, but at the same time, if we want to think of, of regenerating organizations, if we want to think about people and a regenerative resource that is and are people, then we need to be able to make room for some of that failure. And the way that we handle when people fail will build trust. And in order to take risks, we must have trust. And in order to have innovation, we must take risks. 
So by creating space for people to be imperfect, we actually do a really good job of, um, of moving the business forward because the business can be more in innovative because people are willing to take risks because they have a level of trust because they know that when they failed, they didn't get kicked in the teeth. Um, so I think you make a really good point. If we're going to set people up with hard challenges, we need to be willing to um, to let them fail and talk about learning and reflect on learning. We also need to give people lots and lots of development and scaffolding, right? Like I'm not gonna just put you out on a project and have you flapping in the breeze, right? I'm gonna give you mentoring. I'm gonna give you development. I'm gonna stay tuned in enough that I can give you feedback and coach you along the way. Um, those I think are really important too. We're not, we're not just sort of kicking people out of the nest before they have you know, wings that have developed toward flight. We're gonna help them develop the strength in the wings and, and then be ready for them to fly. It's yet my observation that so many leaders maybe get promoted because they were perfectly successful. And the, the idea of the servant leader, more humble leader, these are rarities. In fact, the total exceptions to the rule, with the rule being mostly uh, hard-nosed, control and fear, don't let go, I know everything, kind of leaders. And, and so if that model is to work and failure is to be accepted, we kind of have to promote the failures or at least the people who have known how to fail as well. And, and the second observation, and I'll, I'll finish with that, is that our, the, the, the lesson learned from failure, I think that is one of the biggest failures we have in business in not knowing how to do it. First thing will be, oh, well, you know, you fucked up because of that kind of thing. And so finger pointing and, and, and then figuring out how to, to convert the learnings into the next context because it may not be the same context the client might be different the team may be different and how do you actually convert those lessons learned into the next time so comment yeah absolutely right this is this reminds me of the dumbing cycle of plan do check act right in our western culture we tend to do a lot of do act do act do act we we leave out the plan and the check but that is the place where we will advance together. If we never take time to reflect, we can't improve. And your point about context is important, right? Like when we are reflecting on learnings, we can reflect on this, this little thing did went well and this little thing worked and this little thing worked, but we need to bump that up a notch, right? Like, like, like maybe my, my new project spreadsheet worked really well, but the thing that's more important about that is that I was able to look at the overall responsibilities and figure out how people were connected together so that we could accomplish them together. Or, you know, maybe we, um, maybe we managed that customer meeting brilliantly, but if we bump that up a notch, what we really were able to do was intuit what the customer needed, not just what they were asking about. And we went to the heart of their questions in our um, presentation. That bump it up a notch, I think, are the level of learning and reflection that we need so we can transfer from one context to another, so we can be resilient about where we apply more learning in the next situation and the next and the next. I love the points you're making. That is that is the true crux of learning, which we can think of as double loop learning, right? We're not just learning from the current situation, but we're learning about the process that worked. That's the double loop learning. That's the, that's the second level learning. And, and so often, you know, like so many things like listening and, and humility that goes with it, we just don't have the time for it. We kind of, exactly. we just brush it over and keep doing, uh, doing the same old things. And you wonder why things don't change. My goodness, Tracy, um, lovely having you on. Uh, I would love you to tell us how we can follow you, track you. What would you prefer as, you know, if anyone's listening and would like to connect, what would be the preferred way if you accept? And then, of course, how does someone grab your, your new book, The Secrets yeah, to Happiness thank at Work? You. Thanks for asking. Yeah, you can look me up at tracybrower.com. Steelcase.com has tons of resources. I'm on LinkedIn, Tracy Brower, PhD. So absolutely reach out. Um, 
uh, LinkedIn is a great way to do that. There's a contact form on my website. Um, the book is called The Secrets to Happiness at Work. It's available from all major retailers, um, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Indie Books and all that kind of thing. So, I was just I was just reading that Amazon it. bookstores are being closed. So I guess Amazon only online in the future. Tracy, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show or would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash interdial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on minterdial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger. Anticipating the thrill of your intellect Maybe I tell myself there's no use in me lying I'm a convinced man building an urge I'm a convinced man to live and die submerged A convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man, challenge my fate I'm a convinced man, competition's innate A convinced man, in the arms of a woman Despise revenges and struggle with deceit Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger Tucked around me Precipitating the danger To feel free Trust in my reason And let me show you why I'm a convinced man Practicing my lines I'm a convinced man Finds a convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man, fit to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman.
so many people ask me how I felt when George Floyd was killed. And as I sit across a table from a black man who's about to talk about how the murder of another black man felt, I don't think it really matters how I feel. Hello, I'm Stephen Dorsey, host of Black and White from Evergreen Podcasts. We'll explore and explain how white advantage, bias, and outright discrimination continues to plague our society. Black and White is available wherever you listen to podcasts. 